around, if you like being around positive people. He was uh, one of these guys who was always in a good mood, always something positive to say, no matter what the circumstance. And one of those people that every time you ask him how he was doing, he would have an answer somewhat like, if I were any better, I'd be twins, which I really don't even understand what that means, but I've, I've used it a few times. One day a friend of his asked him, how do you stay so positive? Uh, I mean, I understand it on the good days, but you're even positive on the bad days and on the worst days. How do you stay so positive? And his answer was this. He said, each morning I wake up and I say to myself, you have two choices today. You can choose to be in a good mood or a bad mood. You can choose to complain or be thankful. He said, life is all about choices. Every situation is a choice. Well, a few years later, that attitude was really put to the test when Michael had a terrible accident. He fell 60 feet from a communications tower he was working on. And he was rushed to the hospital, and he found himself in, a, in an emergency room uh, surrounded by doctors and nurses who were looking at him as if he was a dead man. And he realized that he had to change that thinking if he was going to survive. And a nurse asked him, are you allergic to anything? And he took a deep breath and said pretty loudly, yes. And he said the whole room stopped. Everybody stopped and looked at him to see. And he, she said, what are you allergic to? And he took a deep breath and said, gravity. <laughs> he said when the doctors and nurses stopped laughing, he said to them, I am choosing to live. Operate on me as if I were alive, not dead. They operated on him for 18 hours. They put steel rods in his back, and after a months of physical therapy, he was released from the hospital and remains that same positive person today. David made choices every single day, and he chose to praise God. Sometimes in the most difficult circumstances, David chose to praise God rather than to complain and to lose his faith. Every day you have these choices. You can focus on your problems and you can complain, or you can focus on God and praise God and give thanks. You can choose to worry or you can choose to trust. In Psalm 138, we're going to see David, when he chooses to praise God, and I believe there's a lot that I personally can learn about praising God from David, and hopefully you can too. He begins Psalm 138 by saying, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. And I just need to pause briefly to say the gods here uh, is confusing to people because it sounds like uh, foreign gods, the small g gods. We know that David was never around false gods. He was loyal to the true God, Jehovah. And so he's not talking about before other false gods like Baal and all those false gods of his day. He's, that was a term that was given to the kings of David's day. So it's most likely when he says before the gods, he's talking about even before other kings, his peers. You see, David was never shy about praising God. He, was never, he didn't think that this was something that was private that he should keep to himself. But he, when he praised God, he praised God in front of whoever was there. And he was not afraid to praise God in front of royalty and in front of other important people. He kind of reminds me of some of these uh, athletes, these Christian athletes, who are not afraid to say, you know, when they're interviewed and others, who want to say, I want to praise Jesus. And the reporters, you can tell, are so uncomfortable. They want to cut away right away. But there, some of these athletes, and, and sometimes it can go over the top, I, I know, but I admire these guys who are not afraid in front of their teammates and in front of the media. And not, they're not worried about whether it's politically correct, but their first thought when something good happens is, I want to praise Jesus Christ. David was like that. He just wanted to praise God, and he didn't care who heard him. He was bold in his praise. In verse 2, he says, I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. Now, 
David was overflowing with thanks because God had apparently answered his prayer. When you look in verse 3, he says, When I called, you answered me. That's happened to many of you. You have prayed a specific prayer, and sometimes at a time of great distress, and God answered that prayer in such a powerful way that you knew beyond a doubt that God answered your prayer, and that emboldens us. It emboldens us to pray greater prayers and to know that God hears your prayers and, and, and is with you. There was nothing half-hearted about David's thanks and his praise. If you look back at verse 1, he said, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I want you to think about that phrase for just a minute and ask yourself honestly, have you ever praised God with all your heart? What would it look like if you praised God with all your heart? You know, when David was leading that procession into Jerusalem and they were bringing the ark of the Lord, which represented God's very presence into Jerusalem, he was so full of praise that he just started dancing. And he was out in the middle of public. And, and he was in his robes, his kingly robes were kind of inhibiting his praise. So he just took them off. And it left him in what looked like probably a diaper of such sorts. And he, but he didn't care. He was praising God and dancing. And his wife was so embarrassed. He says, oh, how, she said, oh, how you have distinguished yourself today in front of all these maidens. And he basically said to her, I wasn't dancing and praising for you. I was praising God. See, David didn't care who, who, what he looked like. He was uninhibited. And I'll be honest with you, I am inhibited in many ways. And I don't want to dance in front of you because I'd be embarrassed. I don't have good moves. And, you know, and yet David praised God with all of his heart. And I ask myself, have I ever really praised God with all of my heart, with no inhibitions, with, you know, like they say, dance like nobody's watching? Have I ever praised God like that? Because that's how David praised God. He just let it all out. And he praised God for who he is. This is a really important distinction because I'm really big on thanking God. I love to thank God for what he does. And a lot of my prayers are thanks. But praise is different because you don't, praise is not praising God for what he does. Praise is praising God for who he is. You'll see it in verse 2 when he says, for your unfailing love, for your faithfulness. He's praising God for his attributes, for his qualities of unfailing love and his faithfulness that never changes. That's what praise is about. You're praising God for who he is, and that's how David praised God. When he praises God for that unfailing love, he may be thinking about the forgiveness that he experienced with, with God, the time when, when he sinned and confessed his sin and God forgave him for his sin. And we all know about David's adultery and how he covered it up with, by having her husband murdered. But he knows that God's love is unfailing. And because he knows that, he came back to God and asked for forgiveness. If he didn't know that God's love was unfailing, he might have said, God doesn't love me anymore because of my terrible sin. And a lot of people today do that when they sin against God in terrible ways. And that they feel like they can't go back to God. They don't want to go back to church. Uh, they just want to avoid God if, as if that were possible. But David knew of God's unfailing love. So he went back to God and he asked for forgiveness and he found God received him and forgave him in that way. In verse 3, he, David said to God, when I called, you answered me. I want you to consider how extraordinary that is. Because just a week or two ago, I put up a picture of the galaxies, the universe up here, and we talked about how vast God is, how immense and how huge and how vast God is. And now we're saying that that same God who is able to bring out each star and call each one by name and who is bigger than the universe he's created, that same God heard David's prayer and answered it as he hears your prayer and answers it. How extraordinary is that, that he knows you by name. He knows every detail about you, and he cares about the smallest concerns in your life. He cares about that. And when you bring that to God, he takes care of those things. He, he deals with your, your request. David was just stunned by all of that. Bill Hybels, you know, is pastors of big church, Willow Creek up in Illinois, and when he was a kid, his dad was a very high-powered businessman. And he had a big office, and he had a lot of people answering to him. 
And uh, to get to his father, because he was up at a, such a high position, you had to go through all kinds of secretaries and make appointments and, and hope that he might grant you an audience, an appointment at some point. But it was hard to get to him because he was layered with uh, defenses of people because there were too many people wanting to get to him. He had to protect his time. But he had a, a special phone on his desk back before the cell phone days. When Remember that, when you'd put your phone on your desk and you couldn't put it in your pocket and walk home with it? He had a special phone on his desk. And that number, there were very few people in the world, there were a few important people who had the number for that phone that rang directly through to him, didn't go through a secretary, ran directly through to him. And of the very important people on the earth who had that phone number, one of them was his son Bill. And his son Bill, even though he's a little kid, he knew that he could call his dad anytime. And no matter how busy his dad was, his dad would answer that phone and, and, and talk to him. When David says to God, you heard my, I called you and you answered me. I called you and you answered me. He's calling the creator of the universe. And he knows that he, God picks up the phone because it's his son. When you become a child of God, you, when you receive Christ, the scripture says to those who received him, they become his children. They, when you receive Christ, you become a child of God. Now, some people think that every human being on earth is, is a child of God. That's not true. Every person on earth is created by God, but you become a child of God by receiving Christ. And you receive Christ by personal invitation. When you make a decision that, that you need to have a Savior, and you know that that Savior is Jesus Christ, and you first thing you say to him is, is forgive my sin. And then you say, come, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come into my life. Come as my Savior, my Lord. Come as my Master and my King. And you invite him to come into your life by prayer. At that moment, he comes into your life. The Holy Spirit fills you at that moment. And you become a royal child of the King at that moment. And as his child, you have access to him at any time, day or night, where you just whisper a word and he hears you and he answers you. It's extraordinary. And David praises God for this simple truth. When I called you, you answered me. It's remarkable. In verse 4, David says, May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have direct decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. The glory of the Lord is great. David is, is that king who was once a shepherd boy who spent night after night looking up at the universe. He knows how vast God's universe is, his creation. He knows how huge and how great God is. But what's remarkable is that God is not only great and not only powerful, but he's also personal. And he talks about that in the very next verse. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. I think David was thinking of himself when he said, God, even though he is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly because David once held the lowest position in the land. He was a shepherd for his father. There were five sons, and I'm sure at one point his oldest brother was the shepherd, but as soon as the next brother came along, he gave that job to the younger brother. And when the next brother came along, that job went to the youngest, and David was the youngest of five. And so he now has the job that is the least uh, of all the jobs, and that is wand wandering around watching over a few sheep. It's not glorious at all. He's very lowly, below everybody else in his family and in society. And it was in that time in his life, when he was in the lowest position, that God looked down upon him, as he says, from afar. He looked at the lowly. And God looked at him and said, that young boy is going to be the next king of Israel. What a shocking decision. That young boy is my next king. Because Saul had worn out his welcome and had started to depend upon himself and other gods. And, and he, God had told Saul, you know, he's, his time is number, limited here. And he now is going to look for the next king. And when he goes to look for the next king, he doesn't look in the universities. He doesn't look at Congress. He doesn't look at all these. He looks at the lowest person in the land. 
And David remembers that and said, though he is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees him from afar. I want you to know something. Some of you may not feel like you have an exalted position in this world. You may not feel, you may feel like you're kind of lowly on the totem pole as far as people go, not a person of great influence, uh, not a VIP in the world's eyes. But God looks on the lowly, and he knows everything about you, and he cares about you, and you are very important to God. So David praises him for that, and in verse 7, he continues to praise him. He says, though I walk in the midst of trouble, does that remind you of something else that David wrote? Though I walk in Psalm 23, remember, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death or through the valley of deep darkness. He says, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord, vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. David said before that he praised God for his unfailing love and his faithfulness. And now he says the same thing in different words. Your love endures forever. That's why David knew that God's love didn't go away when he, when he sinned, because God's love endures forever. And it endures forever for you too. Don't ever feel that you cannot come to God, that you've done something so horrible that you can't come to God. Jesus gave us that great illustration of the prodigal son whose son had disrespected him in the worst possible way and had gone to a far off place to get as far away as he could from his father and he had done the most despicable things. And he came back to his father not really more for survival than anything else and he prepared this wonderful speech to say, I am not worthy to be your son but I'll just work as your servant. But as soon as the father saw him from a long distance off, he ran to him and he threw his arm around, and the son began his speech. I am not worthy to be your son, and the father never let him get the speech out. He said, bring my robe and bring some sandals for his feet and put a ring on his finger and kill the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate because my son who was lost is found. No matter what you've done, no matter how far you've gone from God, no matter how long you've stayed away, his love is unfailing, and it endures forever, and you can come back to him he will run to you, throw his arms around you, and receive you as his child. Well, there is a hard truth in our relationship with God. And that hard truth is that sometimes God seems far away. I've experienced it, so I know you have too. Sometimes you pray these prayers and God answers prayers quickly and, and you're full of praise and you feel his presence. But there are times when we go through what some have described as a desert experience where our relationship with God seems very dry. They, we look as far as we see. We don't see any hope on the horizon. And we pray these prayers over and over again and, and we're waiting for God to answer the prayers. And if you pray a prayer for a, a month, every day straight, and God hasn't answered it, you start to wonder about that. But if that month stretches into a year, and you've prayed every day for a whole year, and God hasn't answered it, you could get discouraged. And if that becomes five years or ten years, there are times when even the most mature Christians start to scratch their head a little bit, start to wonder, if, why isn't God answering my prayer? This is exactly what happened to Jill Briscoe. Jill and her husband, Stuart, they minister in a church up in Wisconsin, and they're wonderful speakers. Every time I hear one of them speak, I think that that's the best speaker of the two, Whether when I hear Stuart speak. And then when I hear Jill speak, I think, no, she's better than her husband. And they're both tremendous speakers. And Jill Briscoe told a story of, uh, of a time in her life. The way she described it, she said, I was waiting for my soon to become now. Think about that. She'd been praying and praying and praying, and a lot of other people were praying. There was a circumstance in her life and her family that was very troubling and very difficult, causing her all kinds of anxiety. And, and she was waiting for God to, to, you know, to answer the prayer, and she knew he would answer it soon, but she wanted that soon to become now. You know, th that's how we are. We're not very, very patient, are we? So we say, Lord, give us patience, but give it to us now and answer my prayers and answer them now. And when God says, wait, we don't like that. Well, God had caused Jill to wait 
and she was losing patience. And she said that during that time where she'd been going for a long, long time without an answer to this very important prayer, she said, I went down to this little lake where we live, and I, I sat there early, very early in the morning praying and pleading with God to answer my prayer and to answer her prayer now. And she said this to God in her prayer. She said, God, I cannot see you working. What about all the prayers that people are praying? This is a terrible situation. What are you doing about it? Have you ever said something like that to God? There's a lot of people praying for this, godly people who are praying. Why haven't you answered this? What are you doing about the situation? And she said that she felt like God was saying to her, Jill, are there any fish in that lake? And she was taken back by it, and she said, sure, of course. There's lots of fish in the lake. And God said, how do you know? Do you have to see the fish jump to believe that they're there? Jill said that um, she remembered sitting there for a long time looking at the lake. And it was a long, long time before she could say to God, if I never see a fish jump, I will believe that they are there and they are active. And if you never answer a prayer, I will believe. That's faith. You know, C.S. Lewis put it like this. He said, I believe in the sun when it's not shining. And I believe in God even when I can't see him at work. There are times when the clouds cover over and you don't see the sun, but you believe that it's there. And there are times when God is working behind the scenes and you don't see what he's doing. And those are the times that test your faith. Jesus said, it's when he did some miracles and people said, oh, you're, you know, I believe. He said, it's good that you, you see and believe, but it's better for those who will come after you who believe without seeing. That's us. We, you believe in God even if you don't see it. See, there are people, we talked about this the other night with a group, there are people in this world, there are Christians who are what we call experiential Christians. They have to have a big experience to believe in God. And when they see a big experience, whether it's a healing or something else, they get all excited and their faith goes sky high and it's a mountaintop experience. But then afterwards, when they go away, their faith just just dies right out and they go looking for another big experience so the, so the next time they see a big healing or something they, they have another mountaintop but their faith is just goes from peaks to valleys and peaks to valleys because they they depend on the experience in order to believe they have to see to believe and that's not faith faith is seeing is believing what you cannot see that's what God asks of us so when you choose to praise God every single day, you don't choose to praise God when you see him at work. You choose to praise God because you know he is there, even if you can't see it. Every day when you wake up, you have to choose to believe. You choose to trust. And then every day you choose to praise God. Let's pray together. Lord, we do love you. And Lord, you know how there are times when we question you. There are times when we lose our patience and get angry. And Lord, there are even times when we lose our faith and we wonder if you've abandoned us. Lord, you remind us through this psalm and you remind us through David's life that loving you and praising you is a choice that we can make every single day. And Lord, this day, we are choosing to trust in you and to believe in you. Lord, help us every day to make that choice. And we pray that in the powerful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you